Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream on the 13th of December 2022. Martin North from Digital Finance and the Liz here. Great to have you on. And uh, thanks for taking some time out on another Tuesday evening to spend it uh, on, on DFA. Just before I bring Cam in, let me just uh, remind you that we don't provide specific financial legal advice on the channel. We do moderate the stream, so uh, feel free to use the chat and uh, make comments, but to just bear in mind that moderation does work. Uh, this is as at the 13th of December 2022 if you're watching in replay. If you have a specific question that you'd like to ask, use at Walk the World. That will make sure that the question gets into my queue so I can see it. I have also enabled Super Chat, which means that you can get your question top of the list if you want, or indeed make a contribution to what we do here. Without uh, further waffle from me, let me now bring Cam in. Cam, hello. How are you going, Martin? I'm very good. Hello yeah. to you, and thanks very much Thank for you. coming on. It's great to have you on. You've done a recorded show with me, and now you've got the live one. It's really good to, to see you on tonight. Thank yeah, well, it's you. nice to be here. Thanks for having me. And uh, I think um, there's so much I'd like to explore, but I just wanted to switch back briefly because somebody said prove to me that the dog's alive there you go there's meteors having a bit of a dig around on, on the bed just trying to get a bit comfortable just trying to find the optimal position there we go a cookie just to prove that the dogs are alive sorry i just needed to um, in introduce that as it came now cam can we just start with because people may or may not know you and of course you've been involved academically speaking you've written books and a bunch yep. of other stuff but give yourself um a bit of an intro if you'd be so kind yeah, so currently uh, I'm a research fellow at the Henry Halloran Trust at the University of Sydney. Uh, I blog at my Substack, fresheconomicthinking.substack.com. I'm on Twitter at Dr. Cameron Murray. And most of my research these days is about housing markets, planning, supply. Um, but previously, my research was about political favouritism. So my PhD that I finished in 2016 was about political favouritism in Australia and how much that costs us. And so in 2017, I wrote a book with my PhD supervisor, Paul Friders, called Game of Mates, How Favours Bleed the Nation, which was summarising all of the uh, findings or and all of the sort of uh, useful ideas we, we got doing that research. And that's since been republished, a refreshed and updated book is now a 2022 version called Rigged, How Networks of Powerful Mates Rip Off Everyday Australians. So that's a refreshed and republished by Alan and Unwin uh, with uh, data pretty much up until 2021. And uh, so, but, but these days I'm mostly about housing. I, I'm not following too many of the other issues like uh, energy and superannuation as closely as I used to, but very much still, you know, when there's um, when there's some weird policies get announced or some weird analysis, I, I do feel the need to comment. So you'll find all that on fresheconomicthinking.substack.com. Great. And uh, I have to say, I enjoy reading your stuff. And uh, what I find fascinating is the overlay that you've got of the political and power plays that wrap around the issues is mm. absolutely fascinating. And I think if we take property as an example, right, because, of course, that's a beautiful intersection between what's happening in property, there are so many vested interests in the property story, which means that you can't actually just look at it from a purely economics lens. <laughs> You've got to understand this power play that's going on too. Uh, that's 100% right. And also, let's be clear, this is not just an Australian um issue uh, uh you know people are contacting me from around the world now uh, explaining how they're noticing the same things happen in canada new zealand the uk the us um so it's it's definitely the normal way politics happens but i think you know it's really important to be observant and to see where politics is trumping economics and to understand how much that costs us and what we can do better for so sure. let, let's take an example, right, because there's been a big discussion about the rental market and how that should be changed and what's interventions, you know, and should we be building more rental properties? Should we be using a commercial mm -hmm. model around it? Um, I think you and I both have a certain degree of scepticism as to whether this makes a hell of a lot of sense economically, but it certainly is pretty powerful people wanting to make this work a particular way. Yeah, look, that's exactly right. So one of my frustrations is how easily 
um, sort of academia or certain uh, thinkers end up seduced by the stories. So a classic example at the moment is uh, build to rent housing in Australia. We all decided that we need property developers to build more build to rent. So we gave enormous tax breaks. So land tax breaks in Victoria, Queensland and New South Wales so that these corporate landlords could um, build these buildings and and not be at a tax disadvantage to the individual investor who owned just one property because land taxes apply on the uh, individual based on the total value of land they own in the state. And so if you own just one property, you might not pay any land tax, but as soon as you own three or four, you start paying higher rate of land tax. So if you're a corporate trying to build an apartment building with 100 buildings, you are competing with these individual mum and dads who don't pay any land tax. So we reduce the land tax on them, uh, hoping to flood the market with supply and bring down prices. But if you look at the projects that have uh, actually been built, uh, you'll find that the investors who've built these projects are telling, uh, or the, the, the developers who build them are telling their investors that they are fetching a 20% rental premium because they're packaging in, uh, you know, gym services, yoga, hiring an electric car, uh, you know, for for residents, and so they're really targeting the top end of these super premium dwellings. And it's not exactly clear why we gave a tax break for that, all the different states, and how exactly this is a solution to affordable housing when we just start making more and more premium uh, property. So that's just one example where sort of the story of the vested interests of we've got all this land, we need a tax break to do something with it, got corrupted into a story of uh, we're going to do this for affordability. And there was a huge political buy-in on, yeah, yeah, affordability, secure tenancies and all this stuff. And none of it's happened. In fact, you know, I know people living in corporate owned uh, apartments and they're getting the rents put up on them as quick as anyone else. You've got a professional landlord with a professional property manager. They're not they're not in the business of giving you cheap houses and they're not in the business of giving you long contracts unless you pay the market price. So it was kind of weird that we had this story that somehow these professionals are going to give people, you know, sweetheart rental deals, gave them a huge tax break to get it and didn't get anything that was promised. Um, so that's just one recent example um, where... Uh, sort of the vested interest story dominated and and sort of swung the whole policy apparatus for essentially no benefit to anyone. Tax breaks for nothing at the end of the day. Well, the interesting point there is, of course, that they believe that they will profit from this in the end, right? So, so the reason that they're doing what they're doing is not out of altruism. It's because they think they can actually make a dollar. Yeah, <laughs> and, and they're, they're very upfront about that when you actually uh, pin them down. Um, but yeah, this, this whole backstory to pretend that what's good for them is actually good for the tenant somehow, uh, is, is the bizarre thing. And that's how we get this policy capture, we, you know, just the repetition of these stories that what's good for my mates is somehow good for you. Here's a story that we can repeat, uh, ad nauseum in the press. Uh, yeah, it sort of sways enough people and, and you get your tax break or you get your regulatory favor or your upzoning or whatever it is. There's an interesting case in Canada at the moment, by the way, in Toronto, I believe, where um, a, a donor of one of the major parties bought some land in their green belt. And when the party was running for election, they promised we're not going to develop the green belt, we're going to develop elsewhere. And months later, magically, up zoned the part of the green belt owned by their donor, massively increasing the value of that property uh, through the stroke of a pen. Um, so yeah, it's not just an Australian thing. Uh, the the influence of um, well connected politically economic interests is really um, hard to ignore if you want to understand what's going on. <laughs> and. That's what is, I find fascinating because, as you say, it's not just an Australian thing. It is the way the world works. Um, you know, you can look across the US, you can look across the Europe, UK, or as you say, Canada. And the same rules of the game are there, but a lot of people don't understand those rules, right? And it's down to who shouts the loudest, who's got the most influence, who's got the informal 
power relationships. Mm -hmm. And I'm particularly intrigued as to how that overlays with politic political structures and political decision making, because it seems to me that again and again and again, I see political decisions being influenced by those externalities to the point mm. where decisions are taken. And you think what? <laughs> Look, uh, I'm right there with you. Uh, I think the positive spin on all this is that I think most Australians are waking up to the fact that you know we've got the left hand and the right hand of politics it's not that they're different they're still attached to the same body controlled by the same brain um that they're tr you know we've had record uh vote for minor parties and independents in the last few elections so i think people are becoming more aware of that and i'm you know very positive about that uh, in the next little while um, but yeah you, you're totally spot on martin um it's 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 amazing the degree to which um, sometimes the general public's interests can just be bulldozed, uh, trodden over uh, for an obscure uh, economic interest of someone who just happens to be well connected in the right place at the right time. And you could go through banking, you could go through mining, you know, energy, gas, electricity, you know, pretty much wherever well, you look. In fact, you can pretty much tick off all the major industry groups, airlines, almost everything yeah. has got this overlay on it. Yeah, yeah. The, one of the more interesting ones at the moment are the casinos that seem to somehow get these sweet land deals in the heart of our CBDs. Uh, they still get convicted of all these criminal money, money laundering offences and they still get all these deals. It's it's. Um, I often joke that in Brisbane, I'm not sure if you're aware of the new casino. It's right next door to what we call the Tower of Power, which is the the tall building Campbell Newman built with all the Queensland bureaucracy in it. And I just thought, isn't it weird? It's like they it's like they want to be on, in the same building together. They couldn't get any closer if they tried. Um, you know, the dirty money washing through the casinos uh, and the political favours for those you know uh people who who might partake in in washing their money it's uh you know it's it's a bit it's a bit sad in some ways um but uh, uh yeah i'm positive in the long term but maybe not in the very short term so there's an interesting debate of course we've now got a federal icac or equivalent of icac and we've got various state entities that are meant to be sort of making sure that corruption doesn't happen and is you know i guess the question is do they actually really make a difference or do people sort of manage to go around them and through them and under them? Mm. Yeah. So uh, the way I describe it, they, they do make a lot of difference for very blatant um, bribery or direct exchange favours. Um, so we're pretty good at that. It's very hard to bribe someone. What they're not very good at is this game of mates, this indirect favouritism in a repeated setting over a long period of time where favors sort of accumulate on credit there's no direct payment you get it on credit and so in that sort of game you're it's important to keep sending signals of credit worthiness oh if you do me a favor while you're in government i'll look after you when you're out of government my credit's good but i can't bribe you now and i can't pay you much now um so that's the sort of indirect game of mate stuff that is hard to tackle anywhere what we have to do is just have sets of rules that make make it such that when you try and reciprocate those favours, that the value of those favours is relatively small and that the public's still getting a big cut. Um, so you know, in the upzoning case, I uh, like the ACT's betterment tax. So you can upzone your mate's land all you want, but the public's going to get 75% of the value that you're trying to give them. So we're, we're sharing... Uh, the gains, not just putting everything straight in someone's pocket. And that way, even if you have this favor trading persist, the economic cost of it, you've just reduced it by 75% with the stroke of a pen. So whatever industries and sectors you can um, take a share of the gains, as well as try and enforcing different decisions, um, I, I think that's the best we can do and the way we should approach it on a sector by sector basis. Right. So what you're saying is it's making some difference, but there's still a little bit of, you know, riddle, wriggle room around it, but it's better to have it rather than not. 
Oh, the the ICAC, it's definitely better to have it, but I think it's worth remembering that the ICAC is more of an anti-bribery, <laughs> right. anti-padding-your-own-pocket mm. uh, organization, and the rules are written such that that direct um, corruption is quite difficult. But what's more of the current method in Australia is this corruption on credit, you could call it, or the game of mates, which is usually typically done by the rules, uh, and it's done through the revolving door, and we can try and uh, tighten up on some of those things. Uh, but it's 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 like anything; you can't really eliminate it. You can just manage it the best you can. Um, and I think uh, I think people are seeing it and trying to vote for different people to as one way of tackling it. Literally voting for different people in government, uh, getting lots of minor parties and independent makes it much more difficult to do this. And just a sort of history question here, you know, the mm -hmm. game, the game of mates is, is, is alive and well. Did it always exist? Has it got worse more recently? Has something changed to effectively bring it more to the surface? Or is it just that we're more, more aware of it compared with 20, 30, 40, 50, 80 years ago? Yeah, that's a good question. I guess it's very hard to measure this concretely. My gut feeling, based on the research I've been doing, is that it's more costly now. It's always been there, um, but the political competition was more genuine uh, in the post-war decades, whereas now the political competition is not so genuine. Uh, it's really a pretend competition where we both want to look after the same interests. Uh, so I think we're in part of a cycle where we're seeing a little bit more blatant favoritism, a little bit more high value giveaways. And as the public becomes more aware of that, I think there's this pushback. You know, there, there is this homeostasis. There's a some kind of, um, you know, uh, immune, social immune system to it. Uh, we just have to be made aware of some glaring cases and trigger that uh, political desire and we can push back and we can come up the cycle again. And do you think... Uh the media is part of the game of mates problem or are they part mm. of the game of mates solution? <laughs> uh, my opinion of the media has deteriorated substantially in the last five years. Um, I would say they are in many cases, the useful idiots just who don't know better, who get used by both sides for their own gain. Uh, <laughs> I often say, just because a politician says something doesn't make it news. And you've got to also keep in mind that the job of politics is could be summed up as professional lying. So just because they say it doesn't make it news. Everything they sh said should be fact-checked, double-checked, cross-checked. Uh, yet that's not really the way the press operates. If someone important says something, that makes it important, and therefore we report it. And maybe we get a second opinion later and... Uh, so the media, I think, does themselves a disservice and and is easily taken advantage of for these political games. Um, yeah, it's uh, my experience has been, uh, yeah, I haven't been super impressed. There are a handful of journalists that I know who are, who are somewhat impressive, mm. but even they are very constrained. And so, for example, you'll see someone like Michael West, who was a Fairfax journalist, and he was the only journalists digging into money laundering, digging into casinos, digging into these difficult to observe hidden favors that I talk about in the book Rigged. Um, and he was squeezed out of Fairfax and he had to go it alone. And now as an independent, he's able to report on this much more rigorously and much more frequently. And he's become an amazing source <laughs> of information. It's not clear why I have to go to Michael West to find out about these shady deals when there are huge, well-funded newsrooms across the country whose job it is to do his job. And yet one man can essentially out-compete them out of his lounge room uh, with a Zoom camera, a microphone, and a telephone. Uh, so I find that pretty amazing. Now, the press will say things like, oh, well, there's not enough ad revenue, this and that, we can't pay our journalists. Just look at them producing nonsense, right? Like the gossip columns. You tell me 
you tell me you're running out of money and you can tell me what Kanye West had for breakfast, like, uh, spend money on local, you know, newsworthy stories that people might care about if you actually reported them. So, yeah, I, I don't have a great opinion of them. And as I said, there's a handful of, uh, terrific journalists, but it's not the ecosystem of hard hitting, hard nosed journalists that just don't let politicians get away with anything that I think, um, would be a more fruitful and helpful type of industry. And it's interesting because, of course, they still spout the, you know, hold truth to power and hold, you know, the powerful <laughs> to truth. That's what they say they do. But when you actually look at the evidence, you've got to say, apart from, as you say, a few notable standouts, some of whom are not in the mainstream anymore, a few that are. But 90%, yeah. you sort of think, well, hang on a moment, why are you there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh uh, it's it's look it's it's not clear to me. Uh, should I give you this example? I'll give I'll give you an example. Yeah, great. <laughs> okay. There was a Four Corners expose on the housing market in October 2021, and uh, the journalist called me, which was I thought was great, and we had an hour long TV interview talking about all the ins and outs, this and that. In the first phone call, I said. They said, oh, we're, we're doing a thing on how home ownership is out of reach for your average Aussie because of the price boom. And I said, well, you do realize that home new first home buying is at record highs right now. It's double the historical average for the last 12 months. So where did you get the idea that first home buying is more out of reach when we're at a historically high, unprecedented level? And he said, oh, well, that's not going to fit. I mm, have to rethink that. <laughs> Then still had the hour-long interview where I re repeated that, mm. and they ended up not including that information in the whole 23-minute yep. segment that, you know, it, the actual fact of the matter, that this was this is the chart of first home buying. Totally missed it. There was a few other interest, interesting things, but this is Four Corners, and they had time for five real estate agents from Bondi and Byron Bay and all the most expensive suburbs, uh, a few, yeah, they had someone interviewed who'd moved from one of the most expensive suburbs in Sydney to Noosa, one of the most expensive suburbs on the Sunshine Coast. I'm like, exactly what are you achieving here? You're missing almost everything that's going on. Um, and and so that's just one of the, the recent cases where I just thought, what what is going on with journalism here? I, I, I literally sent you the link to the ABS data. I showed you the chart. Uh, I... I told you people to talk to her on the ground selling to these first time buyers in record numbers and the story was just the one that was going to sell and get the viewers and get the clicks and trigger a twitter debate or whatever the case might be so yeah um i get that all the time actually you know people ask me about um what's going on and um quite often around property particularly and quite often I'll throw them the latest data and say, well, this is what's actually happening. You know, the ABS data, which is okay, and other sources and my own sources or whatever. But they often have their own hypothesis that they're actually working with. And if you're not actually supporting the hypothesis, oh, it gets left on the cutting room floor very, very often. Yeah, I, and I think it's like it's almost that they want to they want to do dinner party entertainment and not <laughs> sort of yeah. fact yeah, it's finding, yeah, if no, you know what I mean. Point. Like, yeah. I'm going to tell this story. Mm. Yeah, I'm at Toastmasters. I'm going to tell a nice story and get all this attention. Yeah. But I'm, I, I just want the facts. I want the context. And just um, maybe, maybe, maybe that's years of economics research and doing my PhD and all <laughs> that. Where I, I just want you to tell me the facts in the first sentence and. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Tell me, tell me some of the relevant context. Don't, don't tell me a story, a, a sob story about someone who lost the job who can't afford a house or whatever the case may be. It's just, where are they in the distribution? You know, is this reality or is this yep. the exception that, that makes your story useful? Um, because that's what I want to know if I want that information to be useful and inform me about what's going on in the world. And if I want my politicians to be also watching the news that has lots of facts and, and context in it, not, not these personal tales of woe that you can get a never ending supply of it, regardless of the economic conditions. I, there's not a single year 
in the last two decades where there hasn't been reporting of people complaining about the housing market. Rents going up, people complain. Rents going down, people complain. Prices going up, people complain. Prices going down, people complain. Construction booming, people complain. Construction collapse, people complain. Like, you know, give me the context. Have we come out of a boom? Are we in a collapse? Is rents going up or rents going down? Uh, you know, try and try and focus on some facts before you tell me. You know what's bothering your neighbour, and you know that entertains you that you think will entertain others. You know, there's a wonderful quote from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that says, "They extrapolate the universe from a fairy cake." Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, 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 uh, you, know, you can sort of see where I'm getting at, right? So they pick up the fairy cake. They they pick up the one case of the particular person who's made a terrible decision, who has lost a lot of money on crypto, or has lost a, a property, right? And from that, they extrapolate yeah. the universe out, right? Unfortunately, that might not be a very good analog. Yeah, well, I, I remember the speaking of crypto. I remember that there was a, a current affairs show on this crypto millionaire. And I just thought, wouldn't it be interesting to have some context? Because every crypto millionaire got his millions from someone else who's going to lose millions yes. on crypto. There's a yes. zero sumness to the crypto yes. currency, and and it's just that that just doesn't exist. You could just ask anyone um, uh, with some expertise who doesn't isn't selling you something, uh, and you would understand that to be a crypto millionaire means someone else lost their money to you, just that, like you were at the blackjack table. Um, so yeah, the, <laughs> I'm totally with you extrapolating out and I, I get the temptation. Mm. I get it. Um, but maybe I've been trained now well enough to check the data and just realize that if it's in the press, it's in the press because it's not representative. It's the exception. Like the news is full of things that aren't representative of reality because if they were representative, they would be boring and common and not newsworthy. So I have that context in mind when I watch the news, which is why I double check all the facts and figures and sometimes people get annoyed at me. <laughs> oh, well, I have to say, I also am a great believer in facts and figures, which is one of the reasons why DFA exists as well, because I think it was really, yeah. really quite important to, well, let's yeah. see what the numbers actually, t actually tell us. Now, there was a very yeah. interesting, go on, sorry. Go on. Oh, sorry, I'll just give you one more example. Mm, please, yeah. <laughs> and it came out, it came out just a few days ago. There was an ABC article about the Darwin rental market, <laughs> how there's a Darwin housing crisis. And I just thought, Darwin housing, is there a Darwin housing crisis? So SQM research has a lot of free information. The ABS can tell me what the CPI rental price index has been. And the rents are the same as they were eight years ago. Yep. So I'm just like, which crisis is this? <laughs> no. like, if it's a crisis now, what was it then? <laughs> And actually, rents fell like 20-something percent. Yep. So I, I just don't understand. It seems to always be a crisis, and there's never any context. And it's really not that hard to find out whether rents are lower than they were two years ago or higher um, just because someone's complained or someone's got kicked out because they are in a, they moved to a better suburb because rents came down, and now they have to move back to where they were. That's just normal. That's normal market behavior. If you had some context, we would, you know, it's... I don't like people being forced to move because the rent goes up, but at least you could put it into some some perspective for people and now, and not have everybody who's watched your show think that rents are at record highs in Darwin when they they were much higher a decade ago, just about. I'll give you another example on Darwin because I was talking to someone the other day on my one-on-one -on -one series. We were looking mm -hmm. at um, unit prices and house prices in Darwin, right? And I said, what do they, th what do they think? And they said, well, haven't prices gone up to all-time high and I said well hang on a moment here is a 10-year view right and guess what prices in Darwin were higher a decade ago than they are even today by quite some yeah. margin right they nearly That's fell right. off their chair uh, it's not that hard to do <laughs> and, and it's it, it's that old story that you get uh in all those uh, money uh, what do you call them? Like how to be a housing investor type books, right? The rich dad, poor dads, and this, mm. the, that. They always say people spend more time shopping for shoes than houses. Yep. They do more research on a pair of shoes than a house. And it's true. And I think it's just this, you can be an expert on shoes because you wear them every day, you know what they're like. But because you buy and sell a house once or twice, there's some kind of mental um, barrier there that you just won't look up 
the price chart in your suburb for free on the internet or the previous sales of the same house that you're bidding on at an auction to see what's been going on. Um, yeah, it's, it's a puzzling thing, but I think if it's worth accepting that this is part of human behavior and realizing that um, people who are well-trained in these with this analytical mindset and this data-driven mindset are the exception. And so even, even us, um, we have to acknowledge that other people aren't like this and that will actually influence what's going to happen as well, this hurting behavior, this momentum in the markets. Well, you know, you've hit on a really interesting point, which is where I was going to come on to, the psychology of it all, right? Because you, you can sort of say there's a series of data points and there is a series of stories that you can weave around those data points. Mm -hmm. And then there's this massive psychological um, sort of force that comes over the top and that's partly through going back to the media again and the way that they talk mm -hmm. about property and then you've got um, all of the vested interests who say property and then ever go up you know property doubles every 10 year <laughs> or or is it seven years religiously you know etc 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 and and so you as a as an individual is trying to navigate this sort of incredible environment where you've got so many cross forces pulling in different directions mm -hmm. and you say you don't do enough to learn the ropes so, so essentially you are a cork on the ocean of all of these things going yeah. on um so it's maybe not surprising that we we get all of these weird results but you've got to strip away a lot of this noise if you're really actually going to mm -hmm. make good decisions i think yeah i think at the end of the day you've just got to accept there are some fundamental uh patterns that recur in the data that you have to be aware of and there are things that have never happened before that have good stories for why they might happen, but it's probably not a good bet to predict that that's going to happen for the first time ever now, um, just because people are talking about it. So, for example, uh, you would know that I tweeted a couple of days ago that uh, a prediction that there'll be no Australian recession in 2023. Yep. All right. So partly I did that just to keep my Twitter followers entertained, and <laughs> um, but but also to make the point that. Everybody who's forecasting this also forecast house prices to fall 30% when COVID hit. Uh, they've probably forecast five of the last two recessions. Uh, and if you just look at the patterns in the data, although COVID and the, and the, the economic patterns we've seen are a little unprecedented, um, if you look beneath that little spike th to the trend, you will see that we've never had a huge uh, economic crash from this point. So even though house prices are falling off, we've not had a big crash. So I just wanted to make the point that uh, it's a bit too soon. There's still a lot of investment going on and uh, all those mining profits and all those, um, you know, corporate profits, they're going into someone's bank account at the end of the day. They're coming out as dividends, uh, bank dividends, mining dividends, whatever they are. And those people are going to spend. Now, you might be unhappy with the distribution of that. But if the Lamborghini dealer and the Toyota Land Cruiser dealer have a boom 2023, even if you don't like the distribution of income that year, I can't see there being a huge um, correction. So um, in my mind, looking at the cycles and the previous patterns, it's just a little bit too soon. Um, it's definitely not going to be quarter one or quarter two next year. Um, you know, I might be wrong. I th I put a 75% chance of no recession next year. But if there is, it's going to be right at the back end. There's a lot to wash through the system first. And I've never seen, you know, these patterns on the charts that would have to you know, become reality. I've never seen them before. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to go around predicting oh, this happened. Therefore, something that's never happened before and this is going gonna, is gonna to happen now. And it's worth observing, isn't it? You know, the research shows that it's often 12 to 18 months for monetary policy to flow through into the economy so you see what really happened, right? So the idea of, of, of you know, you turn the interest rate dial up and immediately everything crashes is completely unrealistic. That's not the way the economy works. Yeah, uh, totally. So as, you know, there are some underlying mechanisms in Australia that are a little bit different to elsewhere with our variable rate mortgages and a lot, of the, a huge number of people washing through off their fixed rate onto a variable rate in 2023. So that's going to change cash flows a little bit. But we've also got all those profits. We've got wage rises now finally coming through. Um, there's, there's really a lot of money still washing around. 
In terms of offset accounts and credit cards, people paid a lot of that off. Yep. A lot of everyone, there were hundreds of billions of dollars of stimulus in 2020, and it's not all spent yet. Um, and the very fact that there are people still waiting for big purchase items like the home renovation, I'm going to wait until I can find a builder. And that means I'm pushing back that spending into 2023. Uh, there's plenty of big projects, infrastructure projects, large construction projects coming out of the ground, left, right, and center. They're not just going to disappear in 2023. Um, so I just don't see there yet being a panic. And in terms of the housing market, uh, what we've already had a bit of a correction this year with rents rising and prices falling. You get a 10% rise in rents and a 10% fall in prices. That improves your yield 20%. So although interest rates are going up, you used to get a 4% yield, now you're getting a 4.8% yield. So it sort gross of softens yield. gross, gross yield. yield. Yeah. <laughs> but it softens the blow, softens the blow. Yeah. And and to be clear, historically, we don't really get peaks until the interest rate is twice the gross yield or more than twice. So we're looking at 7 plus percent mortgage rates where you know, maybe they'll come. And maybe they're on, on the way next year and maybe I'll be wrong. I'm not going to uh, say I'm going to be right. But uh, the last time we had um, interest rates this much above housing yields, it still went up for another year and a half to two years. Prices still went up. So uh, I'm just not sure what's going to happen, but I just don't see the imminent crash that so many are predicting. And back to the psychology that you said, Martin. Most crashes happen because no one was predicting them. Where there was this complacency in the markets, whereas now everyone's already anticipating it. So our, our behavior has already changed this year if you expect a crash next year, which it almost um, stops the crash from happening. We're, we smooth it off by changing our behavior today. So I think that's also that psychology angle. You know, it's very hard to... Uh, make it concrete and analytic, but it's just that that vibe from experience that you've got to keep in the back of your mind that there is that psychology to it all. Yeah, that's fair enough. And I guess the only observation I'd make is that, you know, from my surveys, which is very granular, I do see significant diversification in household finances between the one third who I think are really close to the edge and are really struggling to make those mortgage repayments even now and there's more coming. Mm -hmm. The one third who actually are fine and are actually sitting on big wealth pools and actually, as you say, can buy another Lamborghini tomorrow if they want to and are going to do home renovations next year, they're not feeling anything. And you've got this other third in the middle who are a little bit caught but not dramatically caught. So mm. that distribution well, is quite interesting, I think. Yeah, I think it's also just remembering um, that there, there is always some kind of distribution like that. But mm. if we think back to the US housing crash, um, the it it was a lot slower than many people thought. If if you remember, what's the film they made about that? That's hilarious. Um, the Big Short. Yeah. You remember he he was too early. Yeah. He was too early by a long time. <laughs> by a long time. So everybody knows that this cycle does this, and after a boom, there's a bust. Yeah. But being a year or more too early is still you know, not that useful. So I think I've, maybe I've just got too much of that in the back of my mind that <laughs> I'm wary because I remember the 2000s boom and by 2005, 2006, I'm like, there's going to be a crash. It's, you know, it's because I was in Brisbane, I was buying houses from 2002, three, four, and it, things just doubled instantly. We were behind Sydney and Melbourne. And so it was just Sydney and Melbourne boomed and then Sydney came off in 2003. In Queensland, just just it was a vertical line, and I just thought, oh wow, you know, this is you can't this can't just keep happening. Things are going to turn over. Um, but you know, it dragged on another couple of years, uh, and then we got bailed out during the financial crisis and didn't really have a technical recession. Anyway, yeah. so uh, I'm 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 just observing what's happened in the past before and wary of just calling out the big crash because. If we do see those signals start to change, you know, unemployment rising and house prices keep their fall, interest rates can be zero again in one monthly meeting at the Reserve Bank. And all those cash flows are rescued from all those mortgage borrowers who, um, on their variable rates, will 
you know, save three percent of their their mortgage a month, three uh, percent of their mortgage in interest each year. So these are the these are sort of the the active changing variables that that you need to keep in mind. If there's the do nothing trajectory, but when you're predicting the future, you've got to realize that there's never a do nothing holding all else equal trajectory. Uh, there's always the if that starts happening, there'll be some countervailing actions, and the sum of all those is what I'm trying to predict. I think that's very smart because, as you say, there are always you know ups and downs, and you've got to also try and understand how central banks or how government policy, um, treasury, etc., would, would react in those different circumstances. Um, mm-hmm. And sometimes I feel that some of the pure economists have this mechanistic model in their head. Mm-hmm. You know, you put the rates up here and that's what happens. Mm-hmm. But they're not actually taking account of the true realities of the way that the political and monetary forces respond. And, of course, we're also part of a global economy as well as a local economy. So actually yeah. what happens here is also determined a bit by what happens over the, over there as well. Yeah, I'm glad you said that, Martin, because I think you know, if you're hinting towards we are at the mercy of the US Fed in terms of their interest rate uh, changes Mm. and their um, concern about inflation, I think you're exactly right. And that's, to me, the biggest sort of behavioral response or risk uh, in 2023. It's not clear to me whether they have, they, they see the commodities prices turning in a lot of markets and see that actually the 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 economic pressures that caused the 2022 inflation uh, are unwinding and that even though the inflation number might um might not drop suddenly like some of those commodities have dropped uh the pressure is going to flow through to to sort of send that down it's not clear to me how much they want to wait for it to happen before they stop raising interest rates or whether they really want to force it to happen um by keeping to raising interest rates. And if they do, I think Australia might have to also follow suit to a degree to stop the dollar from falling too much. Um, so a lot of the small economies um, you know, are sort of trapped into raising the rate because everyone's going to borrow in your currency and go and get US dollars at a high interest rate. So you do have to follow to some degree what the US Fed is doing. And... Um, I, I'm really not sure what's happening over there on the ground just right now. A lot of things seem to be reversing quickly. Um, so, but again, it's like Wiley e. Coyote. He goes over the cliff. You know he's got to fall eventually. You just don't know how long it's going to take for everyone to realize. Um, and in the macro economy, it's a lot slower than you think sometimes. It's slower than you think, and all of a sudden it's, it happens in one day. And I just... <laughs> You know, it's hard to keep all this in your mind, but it's worth remembering some of these historical cases as reference points. That's right. Well, I've been around quite a long time and I've seen a number of um, stock market crashes and a lot of property price falls from the UK. And it's interesting because whilst they might look superficially the same, each time there were some different dynamics and different things driving them and different policy responses. And so it's it, it's important not to just extrapolate again from the fairy cake of history to try and actually yeah. call the future, right? Yeah, so there's some interesting, um, looking at previous similar points in history, a lot of people are talking about the late 70s and early 80s as being more similar to this current energy crisis combined with housing boom plus low interest rates shooting up to high interest rates you know the combination of factors look more similar to that cycle than the late 80s or the early 2000s um so i I definitely have in mind that um uh, what what do they say uh there are many similarities but each each cycle or crash it has its own unique um, flavor and whether that's crypto this time instead of the u.s housing market or whatever it happens to be um, there'll be a unique flavor to this cycle as well um, and we'll be referring back to that uh, in 15 18 years when the next cycle comes um, for sure now here's a question from a little while ago from, from Jason, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, and thanks for the super chat, Jason, was appreciated. What is uh, Cameron's prediction for interest rates next July? And what do you both think inflation will be 
isn't way out of sp spiral to actually have the recession we have to have like last time. If not, how do we get out of it? <laughs> an interesting set of questions, eh? Yeah. So the cash rate next July, um, I'm going to go with 3.6% or less. Um, how are we going to get out of it? I mean, the question is how are we going to get into it, I think. So how is every what's going to stop everyone spending? Because people paid down mortgages a lot during... Uh, the low interest rates of COVID, and they got money out of super and paid off mortgages. They got stimulus money. Um, as I said, there's a lot of people with a lot of cash around still, and they're not going to stop spending. Uh, will the will the slowdown in the US flow through and and sort of trigger some kind of um, feedback or panic here? Maybe, maybe, but I think that takes a while. Um, so, how do we avoid it? Well, we avoid it doing. Yeah, when we see things turning around, lowering the interest rate and sort of um, replenishing people's spending ability uh, to get them circulating their money again. But yeah, I, look, I, I can't predict the future, but my best bet is that we're not in a recession. The cash rate's 3.6% or below in July 2023. What do you think, Martin? The question was directed to you as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I was going to throw this up, right? So this is the 30-day ASX, right, which is mm -hmm. basically saying it's now got a peak of about 3.65 in September 23. Um, mm -hmm. I think 3.6 is probably a reasonable stake in the ground. Um, I've tended to, to watch quite closely what the um, ASX 30 is doing because I actually mm -hmm. think it's been a better indicator of what's been going on compared with the um, machinations of the RBA, right? Now, if you follow that, of course, the rates were up above four. And they've come back a bit. Um, so the expectation was at one stage 4%, but all the yield curves right. are also now coming back a little as well. So it looks to me as though 3.6-ish is probably a reasonable stake in the ground for that sort of time frame. Yeah, and do you think that the, that the overall economy in terms of GDP growth will um, start slowing down? Or I think or it will slow, but then? I don't think it will go negative. I think that yeah. you've still got the China factor, which, of course, now they're um, turning the, um, the COVID down a little and they're trying to sort of mm. throw a little more, more stimulus. They're trying to drive a bit more um, capital momentum into the property sector and a few other sectors. I think that's important. I think so. Yeah. I think China is probably looking a little more positive. I do think the US is a risk. And, and um, uh, yep. you know, there's no doubt in my mind that the negative indicators in the US are, are coming more negative, more quick than I was expecting. Um, mm -hmm. And yet the, the Fed is still saying, we've got to lift, we've got to lift, we've got to lift. But mm -hmm. you make a really important point. They, they can turn around and say, no, we can now go the other way, right? And they can do it quite quickly. So it's not like it's a one-way street. Um, it's, an, it, mm. it's an ideological fixation they've got about inflation. I know inflation's bad, but when you actually start looking at what's making up the inflation number and the way it's moving, I think there are some base effects that will come out, which means inflation will come down next year. So I'm not sure that I they'll have to go as high as they think. I, yeah, I, I think I'm generally, yeah, somewhat agreement. The U.S. has adjusted very quickly in terms of new housing construction in particular to the rate um, rises there, um, which sort of contradicts why the macro economy goes slower than you think. But again, uh, it's very tricky. So can I just maybe jump in on the inflation numbers for a second, Martin? Because yeah, you've... Um, you know, you've just raised a point about what, what was driving inflation. Mm. And I think uh, one of my bugbears recently has been we've had the biggest inflationary shock for decades and almost none of the reporting has been about the differences in the way we measure inflation in different countries. <laughs> Because we just all assume that yeah. this number is the magical concept that fell out of an economist's brain and we picked the number by magic. And that's the one that we're all talking about. Whereas if you'll see on my Substack from 9th of October, it's called Mysteries of Inflation Measurement. One of the weird things I did when I started blogging was I read a lot of the methodology papers at the ABS about 
how the house price index is measured, how the consumer price index is measured, where different parts of uh, GDP come from and imputed you know, housing rents and all those obscure um, technical technical um, things. And so one of the interesting things in the United States is that used cars are 4.1% of their CPI. So they've said used cars are a consumable that households buy and we should, it's 4.1% of spending. In a, and, and that was a huge part of their inflation uh, for a while. The price index of used cars went up by 80% uh, from, the, from 2020 to the middle of this year. And a 4.1% of the basket was because the CPI is a weighted average of all these um, categories of goods. In Australia, used cars are 0%. They're not in inflation because in Australia, we say, well, one household selling a car to another household is just a swap of a thing. It's not a new good and service that's being produced. Just like if I um, sold my furniture or gave my wife something, you know, I said, oh, you can take a turn taking the car. Like it's, it's, it's a nothing if you think of the households as a collective. So Australia was zero. So you cars, used cars booms and it wasn't even in CPI. Um, and the other interesting thing that's different is in the United States, they have a thing called owner's equivalent rent in CPI, which is 24%, which is a quarter of all of the CPI is a thing called owner's equivalent rent, which is the pretend amount that a homeowners pay themselves to rent their own house from themselves, right? Um, so it's not a real thing that people are actually spending money on because that's counted in rents paid by rental houses, which is 7%. Uh, 7.4% in the US. In Australia, the rents paid by rental houses are 6.2%. So you get that by a third of households are renters and a, uh, a third of households are paying 20-ish percent, so a third times a quarter or whatever you, you end up getting, right? Uh, also, there's a weighting issue because those households have different incomes. Um, so that's very similar. So they've got this quarter of their CPI is not even in our CPI, and yet we compare their numbers and go, look, theirs is going up to 8%. Ours is going to go up to 8%. I'm like, if it's all used cars and owner equivalent rent, isn't ours is not going to do that because we don't even have those two categories in our CPI. Not at all. Uh, so I think that's another thing worth, worth keeping in mind. That's one reason I actually predicted that uh, inflation in Australia would peak around 6% uh, before falling again towards 2%. Now it's currently over 7%, but uh, so I, I think I was... A little bit off in how far it will go, but I think the overall trend of going up to six ish, seven percent and falling, rather than this explosive ten or twelve that you're getting in Europe and and may have had for certain periods in certain cities in the US, um, because used cars weren't in there, owners equivalent rent wasn't in there, and we know that rental prices were a big part of the US uh, inflation measure, and I think that's another interesting point to remember is that when those market rents start falling and they accounted at t not just the 7% for the renters, but also another 24% for homeowners, it might bring down their CPI quicker than ours. It made it go up quicker. It might make it go down quicker as ours, quicker than ours. And ours might be this smooth curve and theirs might be a bit more of a spike. Uh, so I think that's important to keep in mind. And, and the bizarre thing is there are articles and articles all around about you know, used cars is pushing up inflation, owner's equivalent rent pushing up inflation, and and hardly anyone's just saying, hey, that's a uniquely American thing. Um, if, you, if you care about the number, you have to acknowledge that we measure the number differently, even though conceptually the economic pressures might be similar in both countries. So, so that's a little bit of a strange one, but I thought worth pointing out because if we're going to get in the inflation forecasting business of what's going to happen next year worth just keeping a couple of those things in mind i think that's brilliant and very important and of course it's worth saying that the other countries like new zealand and the uk and the eurozone have their own foibles in terms of the way that they measure inflation so you're not comparing apples with apples and apples you're apple, apples and oranges and bananas and what, whatever right um yeah the other factor right. of course is that in the u.s you've got the wages rising very fast at the moment, and that's flowing through into services inflation. So a lot of the inflation that's coming through more recently is service-related rather than some of the other stuff that's going on. Whereas in Australia, wages so far have not really started 
taking off that much, although Mr Lowe thinks it might go up a little bit. Uh, and the other yeah. factor, of course, in Australia is that they started releasing the monthly inflation figures and then promptly adjusted the weightings one month in. So half of the inflation move from a month ago to last month was actually reweighting rather than actually any movement of underlying data. So it shows you the traps for the unwary that you can quite easily fall into if you're not careful. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you. There are many traps for the unwary in in some of this economic measurement. Uh, uh, like, yes, uh, so for example, uh, and another one of those little quirks that I, I wrote about recently was um, how can we have... Uh, household spending increased by a record 28 percent so this is the abs attempt at measuring household spending how can that be increasing at 28 percent per year when wages went up only seven percent per year what are we doing so uh that's another area where people just report numbers and then they tell their story or they, they extrapolate from the fairy cake uh but i i felt the urge to write about that one and say the similar things to what I said earlier, that uh, profits are also household incomes. Uh, and so all those miners and, and shareholders of all, all those companies are, you know, getting ordering new boats and uh, new re house renovations and uh, going out to dinner. And and so there's, there's also a huge increase in what they, we call gross mixed income, which is like your you know, plumbers and your contractors and your self-employed um, people who've had, what, what have we got here, 13.5% increase in that income. And so they're spending as well. So wages are usually only 40% of total household incomes. The rest are from uh, welfare, from owned businesses, and from uh, interest and profits of owning parts of shares and things. So those have been booming. Um, and that's what's helping keep spending up altogether. So again, the distribution might not be the one that we like, but that doesn't mean that people with that money are not spending <laughs> themselves and, and somehow it's keeping the, the economy going. And I remember someone said to me, this is the only, because uh, we've seen uh, consumer confidence uh, survey responses quite low, yet business conditions quite high. And someone said to me, this is the only um, situation I can remember where people are dining out at expensive restaurants for the first time and complaining about the cost of living uh, while they're there. <laughs> like, uh, there's this, how do you, how do you fit all this together? Yeah. And, and yeah, I think it's that we focus on parts of the distribution, mm. which I, th which, you know, I'm very, you know, I'm a lefty. I, I, I want, I want people to just get, I want everyone to have a comfortable income, right? Um, but we focus on certain parts and we miss the fact that on the whole, you know, the top 30 or 40% of people spend a lot of money, right? So um, you've got to keep in mind that their incomes and their spending are also churning the economy over. Absolutely. And it's also, I think, worth highlighting that one of the inflation factors, which is also in the mix, is businesses are still able to put their prices up quite interesting and there's been quite a lot of interesting commentary and uh, analysis showing that in fact businesses you know don't feel the headroom at the moment so i've heard a few first-hand things i'm going to do the journalist thing and extrapolate from one conversation <laughs> but just be you know, disclaimer this is for entertainment purposes only <laughs> um so uh, i have a friend who deals in uh, consumer electronics and consumer appliances and and warned me a year ago that uh, if you if you want me to get you a deal on something, ask me now because everything's going up next year. The, you know, after Christmas, it's it's all it's all going up. This year, he said, yeah, mm, not so much as last year. They're they're finding it more difficult to push price rises through without really affecting sales too much. Mm. In that category, all right. I've had people in uh, what they call. Um, it's the fast dry foods. It's like the f fast consumables. What's the acronym that people use? Uh, someone in the chat fast, will know. Fast moving consumer goods. FMCGs, FMCG, yes, yep. yeah, FMCGs. Yep. And and they were telling me the opposite, right? They're telling me that, oh, no, there's another round of price rises coming through. So, again, uh, 
at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what people think they're going to do or what they're planning to do. It matters what they do for the economic outcome. And if they find that also we've got this heightened heightened price sensitivity because we've just been through this big price adjustment, mm. maybe it's a bit self-limiting as well. So I, I'm not sure which story to, to give more credit to right now. Um, my personal view is that the economic pressures, that wave of um, energy um, prices, the uh, the freight prices, uh, a few of those other things have have come and gone mostly this year. The question is just how long that tra- that takes to translate into consumer prices stabilizing or peaking. That I don't know. Right, that's up to the decisions of all these intermediate steps in the process and how much they think they can get away with, how much advantage they think they can get from the other guy putting prices up, but them not, you know? Um, so those dynamics will be important. And I just wanted to uh, turn the conversation slightly because of course, um, mm-hmm. Phil Lowe has well received a lot of flack in the media for saying last year, for the whole of last year, you know, pretty much no, rate rises until 2024 and then mm-hmm. sort of sort of carries it slightly but of course none of the caveating was actually reported in the media what, what's your perspective on, on on that phenomenon right that that basically he was driving a particular agenda because at the time he was concerned that the economy was at risk and he wanted to try and help talk it up Mm. And, and then suddenly later, everyone said, well, you know, we we committed because rates were so low and people were saying, well, he should lose his job. Mm. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's an incredible dynamic. How do you make sense of it? Or can you make sense of it? Yeah. Look, uh, a lot of people have a lot of cons- issues with the Reserve Bank right now for a lot of idiosyncratic reasons. And I don't really know why. Um, because at the end of the day, Monetary policy is a great big psychological game anyway. And economists know this. Economists know that we drop interest rates during a bus to trick everyone into thinking that interest rates will be temporarily low, knowing that as soon as things go well, we'll put them up again. So it's been a debate for decades in economics is how can monetary policy even work if you've promised to put interest rates down in a bus and back up in a boom? Won't people just average it all out knowing that they're leveraged investments are going to last a a long period of time and that they might have to go through many cycles. So it's not like it's a unique problem. The fact that he said what we all sort of think as an economics profession out loud, um, that we're going to try and trick you into buying up houses, bidding up the price, borrowing money to buy a car and a boat and whatever the case may be, pay off your debts, but do all this knowing that uh, at any moment when if things boom, we'll put the interest rate back up on you. So he sort of said the quiet part out loud um, that it's all this great big trick. Um, so I, I don't know why people are getting so upset about it because even if he didn't say it, it would still have occurred. And um, I just don't know if anyone apart from me, you – and a dozen other economists hanging out on Twitter and maybe at a few newspapers actually follow what Phil Lowe says or would change their behavior based on what he said. Uh, I know I've seen stories, you know, the sob story in the media of someone who's, oh, Phil Lowe said interest rates would be low, so I bought a house. I'm just like, again, you're doing more research on a pair of shoes than a house. Um, <laughs> you know, Phil Lowe said something. Did you get it in writing? You know, this is a big <laughs> deal. <laughs> like, like, if you're entering a million-dollar contract, you get stuff in writing, not mm. of oh, the guy over there said something and, you know, so, it's a non-buy. <laughs> so I've got this theory that when things go slightly pear-shaped, you turn around and try and find somebody to blame, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of people may probably purchase decisions because rates were ultra low and prices were going mm-hmm. up and everybody thought it was a great time to buy, et cetera, et cetera. And then now maybe it not be quite as good as rates are going up, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So they want to blame somebody, right? And, mm-hmm. and rather than taking personal ownership of their decisions, many people will say, oh, well, you know, I was listening to the guy over there who said this or I spoke to my mortgage broker and he said that, or my lender gave me the opportunity to borrow this amount. 
I get a bit frustrated with a lack of personal accountability for people's mm. own financial decisions. Now, that may be unpopular, but I actually think it's an important line of argument. Uh, I agree. Some of the stories that make it to the press, I just can't believe they can't be representative of what's going on, um, given just how many first home buyers got in uh, the market in 2020 and 2021. But yeah, it's it's a weird thing. And I think it's just the fact that um, home ownership is such a entrenched part of people's identity that they sort of put aside reason and they've seen it be successful everywhere. So they just, they, they don't see risk. They just plow ahead. Mm. Oh, if they give me the money, it must be good. Oh, everyone's making money out of property. Well, it's the, and, it's the barbecue conversation, isn't it? You know, yeah. How much did yeah, I make last they, year when prices go up? Yeah. Of course, no one at the barbecue tells you how much they've lost no. in property. No one tells you they bought a house in Darwin in 2012. It's worth less than what they paid for it. And they were negative gearing. So they're making a loss on it up until the, interest rates fell in 20 sort of 17 so um yeah you don't hear those so i think it's always the case in every market there's someone at the margin right someone who's stretched to the limit to be the next buyer or get the winning mm. bid mm. um and it's just those are the people who who get the airtime and i just uh i don't see that representative of the average and for a lot of first home buyers when interest rates were very low the last couple of years renting money was much cheaper than renting the same house they were in. Yep. I always say you've got two options for a house. You rent the house from the landlord or you rent the money from the bank to be your own landlord. And, and, and yeah, they're both risky. There's a present value of all the future rent rises that you pay doing this. And there's the risks of all the interest rate rises doing that, but there's no escaping this, um, these sort of two options and the trade-off that comes with it. So I think a lot of people switched over here. Now that rents are rising here, I think, you'll find that it still makes sense for people to just pay the extra in their mortgage than try and pay 20% more rent um, in the same place or if they had to move and incur those costs. So, yeah, uh, but the personal responsibility thing, you're totally right. Um, at the top end of the market, it's entertainment, mm. like the block and uh, you know, the, the super prime suburbs of Sydney and the Gold Coast and the Sunshine Coast and the, the elite suburbs of Melbourne. It's entertainment. Oh, they paid $4 million, now they paid $5 million. Here's a suburb record. Oh, it's the $10 million house. It's entertainment. Those guys can lose their money. But, um, yeah, the, the industry is not renowned for, how do I put it, uh, widely acknowledging risks. No. on both sides no 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 that's for sure and, and look one of the things that i try to do um on the channel here when i talk about property purchases to try and help people make better informed decisions by getting more information right and you can't mm -hmm. just take the average of property price moves in sydney or whatever you have to go granularly you have to look mm -hmm. at the local situation all those things you got to also run the counterfactuals what happens if this happened rather than that happened and make sure you've got the right preparations in terms of surveys and other information to be able to actually make good decisions. What I find interesting is that I can pretty much put people into two categories, right? There are those who actually take all those things on notice and try to make better decisions. And there are others who say, too hard, don't need to worry, prices will only ever go up, I'm just going to buy. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can do much for that group who basically just have this particular ideological view of the way that property works, particularly in Australia, you know, property has never gone down, it's always gonna go up, you know, we've never had a real recession in property, mm -hmm. they say, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, it's really interesting, again, it goes back to this psychology and philosophical driver that's actually making people do what they do. And I'm not sure I totally understand it because I'm in the sort of the analytics, I really want to know all the data mm -hmm. and I want to really try and optimize my decision making other people don't seem to care and i'm not sure whether that's a good thing or a bad thing but it's an interesting observation yeah so it is interesting but uh, i used to work for a couple of property developers and let me just say some very very big decisions that a lot of big companies also get made by gut feel as well like <laughs> this has worked in the past i don't care about your spreadsheets or these risks or these scenarios um i think it's a good deal uh, so again, I think it's that human nature thing that there's a lesson there that 
at the end of the day, no one knows the future and everything's risky. And I think as long as the person taking the risk uh, is aware that it's risky, aware of what their options are, they can do it on gut feel, rule of thumb, because grandma told me or whatever the case may be. But if you are um, sort of going in blind, uh, I, I don't know really what we can do. You can't save people from themselves. And to be honest, I'm sure plenty in that group that you talked about who just did things anyway and the information didn't sway them, I'm sure a lot of them did very well in the long run anyway. So, so it's very hard to know. Uh, again, this question of responsible finance, I think also what you're pointing to, Martin, I know um, we had that Royal Commission that highlighted that uh, banks are, don't have don't have a, a huge grasp of risk either. <laughs> so well, they, both have, sides a particular, of the they have a particular lens on risk, right? So mm. basically they're interested in making sure that they can find a way to get paid back one way or the other. But that isn't the same as making sure that households can actually afford it, right? Or that households yeah. have done the due diligence to understand what happens if, right? It's it, Again, it goes back to yeah. different perspective because they're coming from a different set of agendas. Oh yeah, I'm I'm totally with you. So on that um, on that finance question, can I just run by you? I'm trying to test a uh, test a, a bit of a an explanation with you about finance um, because there's the idea buyer beware, right? Well, you know, if they're going to lend you money, you're taking the risk, right? Um, it's why should the bank um, stop you borrowing money if you think you can handle the risk, right? Yep. But it's not clear to me that, that that's, you know, this finance is a two way street, right? So the bank is also buying a service from the borrower of future repayment because it's the bank that actually gives you money. So, in any type of, when you buy something, the person who gives you the money is, is the buyer. And when you borrow from the bank, the bank gives you money. So, they're actually buying your future service as a borrower. And so I think there is some kind of buyer beware justification for regulating the behavior of banks to, um, on, on that side of the finance equation, to eliminate the fact that the other side is uninformed about the risk, because the bank is also a buyer of, of home borrowers mm. in a way. Um, so that's the way I see it. And I think that what happened in 2017 after the Royal Commission was quite reasonable in many ways. Um, we didn't get so many rule changes, but banks gave interest rate advantages to home own, owner-occupied lending compared to investor lending. You know, recognizing that these two classes of borrowers have different risks and um, different systemic risks in terms of if everyone tries to sell at once, the investor might, you know, be more keen to flood the market and dispose of things than their own occupiers that might keep things smoothed out during a downturn. So I think all those outcomes were pretty reasonable and actually um, captured some of that risk. Um, what, what, how would I put it? They sort of embedded some of the precaution that you would want uh, in their lending to address the fact that the buyers are, uh, can be very risk-taking and unnecessarily so. Yeah, and it's fascinating because if you talk about behavioral finance which is what we're sort of getting into here right what, you know, what drives people to borrow how much and you know some of it's to do with aspiration because they want a bigger place or they want a shinier place or, or whatever it's also an expectation of future capital growth mm. because property only ever goes up quote unquote um from mm. a bank's perspective of course the bank's interested in portfolio risk and of course a lot of the the lenders when they report their portfolio risks do it at an aggregated level. So don't actually look at individual borrowers or individual financial circumstance of individual borrowers. It's an aggregation, mm -hmm. right? And, and so banks are making lending decisions based on a portfolio view. So they don't want to overestimate risk in particular areas or particular postcodes or types of mm -hmm. property, but, 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 it's, but it's a portfolio, right? And that gives them some leeway then in terms of actually making individual lending decisions. The other point on all of that is that when things change, so when interest rates start to go up, borrowing power, of course, is automatically crimped, right? So on average mm -hmm. now, the borrowing power is about 30% below what it was because of APRA's 3% rule, mm -hmm. which means that there are some checks and balances in the system as to, as to how things 
to evolve and change. And that's already putting a downward pressure on some lenders' ability to lend and some borrowers' ability to borrow. So there are yeah. some automatic stabilizers in the system, yeah. which, again, I find interesting. Not many people are talking about that, right? But it seems to me it's an important element. Yeah. I, I mean, I, in my view, that's sort of the intention, right? Mm. To, 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 to have some kind of automatic stabilizer in the system. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that, that makes total sense to me, Martin. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't have anything to add on no, that. Cool. I agree. No, okay, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we're sort of coming toward, <coughs> excuse me, take a drink. I sucked instead of blowed. Um, we're sort of coming to the end of the show. So I, I was interested, just sort of forward looking a little bit. Um, what are the key sort of things that you'll be thinking about as we come into 2023 from an economic perspective? What are the, what are the sort of uh, the, the, you know, the leading flags that, that mm -hmm. would say, hang on a moment, this is important, this is not mm -hmm. important? Mm -hmm. uh, and how does that then map back through to property? And I'm also interested in your view and how migration plays into that too, because, of course, migration mm -hmm. is now coming through the roof. Yeah. So maybe we start with migration. Yep. Uh, so the net arrivals are roughly at 2012 levels at the moment and rising steeply. Mm. Um, so I see that as a big uh, positive in terms of overall economic activity. I actually see that feeding through to investor buying of off the plan apartments and another wave of apartment construction. Because what we've seen in the last couple of years with COVID is a a relocation of people out of the cities to the regional towns and lifestyle areas and the outer suburbs. And we're seeing that reverse. And with the migration into city of Melbourne, those inner city apartments will all get taken up and it'll make sense to chug along with that uh, construction portfolio for those developers. So I think we'll see a pickup in apartment construction. We'll see a pickup in city economic activity with migration. So that's another what thing in the mix for my 2023. Re uh, no recession is more likely than a recession. The thing I'll be looking out for is probably the U.S. You know, the U.S. housing construction, U.S. overall growth. Um, I really think it's useful at the moment to imagine the United States as a window into the future. And if you want to know what's coming down nine months ahead see what's going on there um so that's what i'll be keeping an eye on things housing construction house prices in the us overall economic activity um and also the decline in energy and uh, resources so if there's a huge collapse in energy prices uh and resource prices then i think that's not ideal for australia but if if it's a sort of bouncy bouncy decline uh that'll all be fine uh in terms of those resource profits and and mining activity in australia yeah. that, that, that's sort of the main elements what are you thinking martin well to, to add? so I, I actually put a poll out um on the show tonight and i basically said what were the most important issues for 2023 i put forward up for people to sort of vote against mm -hmm. housing affordability cost of living and inflation energy mm -hmm. prices and international relations and it's interesting the, the poll said 33 percent housing affordability 48 percent the cost of living and inflation mm -hmm. 10 percent energy prices and 10 percent international relations that's quite interesting um i do think the inflation cost of living thing is probably the most significant factor in the mix for many people and mm -hmm. i guess i'm influenced a little bit by the fact that the um research through my surveys and, and the stress numbers mm -hmm. continue to rise. Now, remember, I measure stress on a cash flow mm -hmm. basis, money in, money mm -hmm. out. That's not defaults. That's not necessarily mm -hmm. not being able to pay the mortgage, but it's trying to actually understand how many people are actually having to dial back, mm -hmm. prioritize and spend less. There's a growing cohort in that group. And I'm not sure that anything that I'm seeing in terms of the political levers like energy and those sorts of things mm -hmm. are necessarily going to help. And interest rates probably go a little higher before they go lower. That's not necessarily going to help. So I think we've got a chunk of Australians 
we're going to find 2023, particularly the first half, probably pretty difficult. Right? Yeah. But I also think, as I said earlier on, you've got this other group, this other cohort that's doing really well and their wages are growing and they're mm. switching jobs. And so we've got this amazing bifurcation mm -hmm. in the economy. Yeah, and I, I agree. I think inequality has bounced a lot um, during the COVID period uh, mm. because of the profitability. Every, yeah, corporate profits, as I say, were up 28% mm. over the years and wages up 7%, mm. um, the wage price index. So definitely that's the case. Uh, I would imagine this, the, the countervailing um, forces, I think, are that uh, the number of people per dwelling fell to an all-time low during COVID. People... Yep sort of uh, group houses, you know, share houses, they all dissipated uh, and people moved to the regions, which is interesting because that can only happen if there's a whole bunch of spare empty houses floating around. So those who talk about the housing supply thing, I'm like, how did we you know, drop... There's more than a million the, spare properties, according to the We census. dropped the number of people per household mm. by um, whatever it was, 10 or 15% somehow, uh, in a matter of months, there must have been a whole bunch of empty houses that people moved into um, because the population didn't go down. Uh, so that was an interesting um, point. So I think in terms of housing affordability, we'll see a bit of a reversal of that and we'll see more group households and share housing like we did in the 2010s when you know, Sydney was very expensive, for example. So that's one way to consolidate on that spending. On the energy we're, we're quite lucky in Australia that energy is only about 4% of household spending. So even the large price hikes we're seeing in domestic power, they will come through via um, the price of goods and services, the price of construction materials, bricks, high energy intensive things, but uh, not so much a huge effect through the actual energy bill. And... Um, what was the other thing? We we actually spend more on fees for superannuation than we spend on electricity. Yes. Right? So to keep that in mind, uh, we're all worried about the sh power bill shock. And yeah, we actually have to pay it out of our bank account each quarter. But by the way, it's just, you're paying more in super fees probably Th 30 than electricity. Billion. 30 billion on average, right? So that, that's just some perspective. Yeah. So it's not ideal. And of course, again, the distribution comes into it because the 4% average is going to be 6 or 8% at the bottom, 20% of the distribution and, and a few percent at the top. Um, so I think, yeah, in terms of housing affordability, I think the consolidation of households will be uh, one way that people deal with this. And in terms of the flow through of um, high energy costs, People will adjust their energy usage, and it's a small part of the basket. Like uh, I think, um, you know, we're we're not going to see massive further inflationary outbreaks that would sort of change my view on that. But again, I don't know the future, but I mm. I have sort of a bundle of scenarios and a few probabilities of which twenty twenty three we might see. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you which uh, I can tell you which one I think is most likely, but I'm not going to say one's never going to happen. Well, by definition, there are too many variables, aren't there? Yeah. I and mean, you know, we don't know what's happening with the U Ukraine and you know the the conflicts in Europe, and we don't know what's happening in the U.S. with regard to a recession or not. China is an interesting externality. We've got issues yeah. here in Australia. You know, my theory is that we're going to see probably an outbreak of um, you know, wider industrial conflict because of the pressure on jobs yeah. and pressure on wages. Um, and I also think the unemployment rate is artificially low at the moment by half a million people who all left, of course, because of those ah, yes. right? So, so you were talking about the, the early retirements, people leaving the workforce. Well, I'm talking about um, firstly the, the temporary, temporary workers who went offshore through COVID, half mm, a million, plus mm. those who've moved into retirement. Interestingly, in the UK, some of those are now coming back into the workforce because the cost of living have got so high that they can't afford not to be working again. So that's another factor in the mix. So all I'm well, saying, uh, yeah. Yeah. and that may and that may happen here as well, mm. right? Um, m luckily, home ownership is very high in the in the over sixties age group. So mm. it, it will be a small group of people who feel the rental but squeeze. A lot of them still have mortgages though at sixty now. Um, that's true. And I think what you'll find is a lot of the squeeze there was in regional areas. People who've retired to cheap areas for cheap rent 
um, you know, trying to use their super before they go on the age pension. It's really hard to stay where you are if you lived in a regional town that just boomed uh, because of that outward migration from the cities. Well, sure. here we are, pretty much at the end of the show. So I want to say thank you very much indeed for sharing your thoughts so free. I really enjoyed the, the, the conversation. Um, any, any sort of closing thoughts in terms of um, the conversation? Anything that we didn't say you want to say? Uh, look, the only other note I had written down was the, the fake housing affordability solutions. And we talked about the build to rent right at the start. What we didn't talk about was the social housing fund that seems to be the latest trend and um you know, as we've mentioned many times um there's the macro economy and there's also the distribution of households within that and some are obviously struggling and and we seem to want to do anything except build houses and give them to people cheaply so what governments are doing now is saying i won't build any houses for you what I'll do is I'll take two billion or twenty billion, and I'll go to the share market, and I'll buy all these assets with it. And with a bit of luck, I'll return more on those assets than it cost me to borrow that money. And with that little bit, hopefully there's some money there. I might build a few houses and 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 help this part of the distribution who's struggling with the rising market rents in regional towns because of the patterns of uh, relocation we've seen. So that's just uh, one of my pet peeves is these weird fake policy solutions if we want to give people cheap homes we seem to try everything except giving people cheap homes absolutely um who need them so uh, it's just the, one of those puzzling the, things no the, the fascinating thing is of course is that they continue to try and use quote market unquote mechanisms to try and solve what is not going to be solved by market mechanisms right that's the problem yeah. there's a fundamental well, philosophical roadblock in that in their thinking you, uh, exactly that's the way i say say it martin i said well the market will give you the market outcomes mm. if you don't like the market outcomes don't expect the market to give you something better that's what it does it satisfies the top half Correct. of the distribution yep. if you go and read any economic textbook about housing markets for the last 200 years you'll find the private markets suit the top very well and they suit the middle okay uh, but the poor are never able to seem you know are never able to get their own dwelling in the private markets and every country that's really housed the poor or, or broadened home ownership has done so with public schemes and we know it works for hospitals and we know it works for parks and we know it works for schools but for housing no we throw our hands in the air and say uh, we, we just can't do it um, the market will have to do it for us even though in economics there's this weird situation where people keep saying public housing is too expensive because you have to subsidize housing to make it cheaper than the market price we will trick private uh, property owners to subsidize housing and build and rent to people below the market house market price and i just think how is this possible that you hold these two views that public housing renting places below the market price is unaffordable for the government but somehow the private market will do it voluntarily just because they're nice guys it's it's a it's a weird um you know as we said earlier about economists it's this weird model attachment but not looking at the data or the the world in front of their eyes in some in some ways it's a little bit like those um the journalist approach of having a story and really wanting to stick to the story it's having an economic model and really wanting to stick to it rather than just looking at the data in front of you and going, oh, I cannot find a single city in the history of humankind where they've housed the poor uh, through the voluntary market property market mechanism. Uh, but it will work this time. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's a weird one. Uh, it's ideology rather than anything else, isn't it? There's a, a set of ideological sort of tenets, which I see in Treasury and I see at the state level, which means yeah. that they're never actually going to be able to solve the fundamental issues that we're dealing with because ideologically speaking, it's not within their bailiwick. And that's the problem. Uh, you're totally right. And look, look, I'm an economist. I'm a fan of markets, mm. but I acknowledge that sometimes the mixed economy works pretty well as also, especially if there's a fairness element and a huge part of the household costs, right? Healthcare is really important, so that's why we let everyone have it. Uh, for free, we create this huge institution. Housing's pretty important too. Yeah right um especially when you're struggling especially when rents are going up uh in your regional town just these spikes and the forced moves um yeah we, we can try something different i'm sure 
Well, I want to say thank you very much. And just remind everybody again, if they want to get to, to your Substack, where do they go? Uh, it's fresheconomicthinking.substack.com. And you can find me on Twitter at Dr. Cameron Murray, all one word. Terrific. Well, thank you very much for your time tonight, Cam. Really enjoyed it. And uh, we must do it again sometime in the new year. Let's do that. Have a great Christmas break, Martin. Thank great you. to chat. See you. Take care. I'm going to take you offline now. Bye-bye. So there you go, folks. I hope you enjoyed that. Very interesting and informative conversation with Cam. I always enjoy uh, a good philosophical discussion. Just to tell you that uh, next week uh, I have um, Tony LeCantre coming on and he's going to give a bit of an end of year review from a markets perspective. So that'll be worth watching. We'll be able to play LeCantre bingo again, which um, I'm sure will be uh, ticking off some of his normal um, phrases. So Mike Hudar is there. And finally, just a quick uh, reflection. The doggies are still sound asleep. They haven't moved now again. So uh, there we go. The doggy cam is still live. So thank you very much indeed for spending some time with us this evening. I hope you found it interesting, useful and uh, join us next week for another live stream. See the other shows during the week and uh, have a good evening. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off. Cheerio.